students uh, that you got on the way in. And uh, please, uh, if you could, give us uh, any ideas that you might have in regards to future topics or future speakers that you'd have interest in. Uh, today, it's my pleasure to reintroduce Dr. Selden Spencer. Uh, Dr. Spencer is board certified in neurology and also certified in polysomnography and neurosynology. Um, also, most importantly, is he is a, uh, a, a frequent and excellent contributor at uh, Grand Rounds. Uh, he's here today to do, uh, discuss the numb in the week, a, rever or a review of peripheral nerve problems, and please join me in welcoming Dr. Spencer. I did this right, Jim. We'll find out. Oh, this sounds good. All right. Okay. So uh, the screen already showed that I don't have anything to disclose, and. Um, this is, uh, I've thought about this um, quite often about what I'm trying to do here, and I think at the end of the day, this is really kind of a personal approach to peripheral nerve problems. Uh, this is not an exhaustive encyclopedic review of every peripheral nerve malady that is known to man. And uh, actually, as I kept truncating the talk, um, I initially wanted to, to be like the good, bad, and the ugly. I was going to be the weak, the numb, and the painful. And I just dropped the painful off. Because pain as a sensory modality is just very strange. And I think all of you appreciate that there are complexities to pain. You rarely, rarely, rarely have a person with a um, central nervous system problem saying, um, I have jiggling in my foot, or uh, I have numbness in my foot, or, well, I apologize, but the, the, the general idea is pain is just too complex as a sensory modality. So I'm going to do another talk about pain somewhere along the way. It just gets very morphed, and I want to thank some of my colleagues and I'm also that reviewed this talk, and then I also want to thank some of the other colleagues, including Megan, who does a lot of nerve conduction studies that uh, are here. And I sure hope there's some physical therapists here because um, they are the real body mechanics that uh, hopefully will chime in. I see Dr. Pogue is here, so I hope you all will feel free to jump in and correct me or whatever you need to do as we go along. So just to make the obvious, we're talking about the peripheral nervous system. It doesn't have anything to do with the brain and the spinal. And I should say that I have wonderful books, and I was going to scan lots of images, but I got totally seduced by Google images. So everything's from... Uh, Google Images, and that's actually kind of a good thing because you're going to have to stay awake because there's some mistakes. Not everything you see on the internet is true, right? So the, you, we will be astute observers here and pick out what was wrong on the internet, okay? Uh, so the main focus is going to be on focal mononeuropathies of the upper and lower extremity, and then trying to distinguish them from root and plexus problems and then a very brief overview of polyneuropathies and a very simplistic approach that I take toward polyneuropathies, and then very briefly how you can use nerve conductions to help sort that out. So, as with everything, you're seeing your patient, you're trying to figure out what is uh, going on, um, and there are key words that I think are very valuable in directing you away from the central nervous system. And certainly, if that person will tell you this is an electrical sensation, you're in the periphery. Don't worry about the central nervous system. Yes, you could have something going on exactly at the nerve root uh, in the neck near the spinal cord, but by and large, it's peripheral if it's electrical. And then likewise, if that electrical sensation can come from uh, a positional phenomenon, if you move the arm or the hand or the leg or the foot in a certain way and yow, it all happens there, you know you're in the periphery. If it is faithful to what the textbooks say, you know, I always say, did the patient read the textbook? You know, because you want to know that the nerve is obedient to what is known as far as the anatomical distribution, both sensory and motor. The other words, however, I'm not so enthusiastic about. Tingling, probably more likely peripheral. Dead, maybe. 
Um, dull, aching, maybe not. Throbbing, probably not. These are all words that will come up as you're talking with the patient and trying to figure out where is the source of their misery. As far as the examination, um, in my view, um, if the person is uncomfortable, trying to establish whether they have weakness in a particular distribution is a waste of time. If the patient is miserable and is not going to cooperate, not going to help you, then forget it. On the other hand, if the patient can muscle it up, and even if it's hurting, can give you a 5 over 5 strength uh, in an appropriate distribution, that's very, very helpful. And so you are trying to isolate relevant muscles to your suspicion about a peripheral distribution. And then as far as sensation, um, there's oftentimes a problem with trying to use the modality of pain. I guess I already said I'm not a little leery about pain testing, but that's key. It's a very useful way of determining where the nerve problem is. But the patient has to understand that we're talking about pain. We're not talking about pressure. We're not talking about sensation. We're talking about pain. So uh, isolated little pain prick has to be, you know what pain is, first of all. You know, do you feel that pain? And you go to a part of the surface which is normal, hopefully, and it, yeah, I understand that. Okay, then you go to the foot, and then you're testing the pain aspect. Um, if you get a great pattern, that's great. If you don't, don't worry about it. There's a saying in neurology that neurology would be fun without the sensory exam. And uh, that it is very true because people are very vague. And actually, that's a clue in and of itself that if they are not really clear where their sensation is disturbed, that may mean that this is not a peripheral problem. Maybe you, you're off on the wrong tangent. Okay. Lastly, reflexes um, are very helpful. Certainly, if they're gone, then you're more comfortable that this is a peripheral problem, right? Because, if anything, the reflexes are going to be increased if it's a central problem. But it's hard to get reflexes, as you all know. And basically, you want to say, hey, I want your arm to feel like a limp, wet noodle. And then use that visual imagery to try to get the patient to relax and see if you can get a bicep jerk or a triceps jerk. Uh, certainly, if you get some asymmetry out of the reflexes or an isolated finding with your reflexes, it's very happy, very happy, very useful to you. But otherwise, we're not going to stress on that. Okay, so now we're getting into the the uh, th business here. Does this show up? Yes, very good. Okay, so where the next question is: Where on the nerve are we? Is it the root? Is it the plexus of the nerve? And um, I apologize. Uh, let's see here. Get this previous slide. Um, I just wanted to show a brachial plexus and a lumbar plexus to show that it's a god awful mess. You know, it doesn't make any sense at all, right? Uh, and so you have these isolated, clean little roots coming out that go into this gaggle that are going this way and that way. And then you have them coming out into very clean nerves. Very nice that way. In the lumbar region, I think. What I really want to kind of point out in here, it's the same kind of gaggle and mess, but you have sensory uh, distinctions from the sciatic nerve, for instance, that uh, become very important in trying to sort things out. So, upper extremity, very clean, very sensory. I think it uh, takes a neurologist to say that the uh, arm is quite different than the leg, right? But the uh, the point here is that we have a very clean system in the arm. The radial nerve curling around the humerus, coming to the dorsum of the hand, the ulnar nerve and the median nerve on the opposite side of the arm coming down on the um, ulnar aspect of the arm into the palmar surface. Very nice, very clean. And this is a beautiful picture which does not show up in your handout because your handout is probably black and white. But this is uh, two things that I would like to emphasize and that will show up later in a slide that's wrong, um, that you have in a root distribution, cervical root distribution, involvement of both the fifth and the fourth digits, whereas an ulnar nerve will split that fourth digit. That's money in the bank. If you can get that on an exam, you're home free. 
Um, likewise, on the other side, even though we're talking about ulnar nerve, we're going to note that the C6 involves the entire thumb, while the median nerve is going to be more on the palmar surface of the hand. We'll get to that later. So, in terms of ulnar motor testing, interosseous muscle like this is a very useful work of art. You can just work that very easily. John has promised to help me a little bit. Why don't you come down here a little closer? This is John Wilson. He works in the EEG lab. And so come on out here where we can see you a little better, John. So very simple. Just spread the fingers wide and then just kind of check it out. You want to go to a muscle that you can beat. You have a seat there, if you will. Um, and uh, trying to automatically go to the strongest muscle of a patient is usually not a great idea. So in this picture, uh, this person has gone too far. What's interesting is the hypothenar eminence isn't particularly wasted, but they have curling of the two uh, fifth and fourth digits. And uh, this man is testing the interosseous muscle. And the note to the audience, do not put your finger in the electric outlet, as it's shown in this picture, right? Um, so, uh, so is it ulnar? You kind of say, well, is there atrophy? What's going on? We have to evacuate or no? All right, okay. Um, we do have a water main leak, I guess, over there. So I should ignore this, do you think? Okay, he'll check on that. All right, so is there atrophy or weakness in the hypothenar eminence? This is a hypothenar eminence. Is there sensory deficit? Again, splitting that fourth digit, that can be extremely valuable. Can you provoke the symptoms and can you come to the nerve as it circles around the elbow, which is a very common place for compromise? And then does the picture better fit with a root or a plexus or a central? You say to the patient, does it feel like you've hit your crazy bone? Man, they can just lock onto that very easily. So one of the problems with the ulnar nerve, it can get compressed here at the cubital tunnel, which is the medial aspect shown very nicely in these beautiful pictures. And I don't know, a lot of different things. Sometimes you see people with a very flat canal there. Sometimes you feel a very bulging kind of ligament, and I think you all know where it is. And uh, that's key for sorting this out if it is an ulnar nerve problem. And it's surgically amenable to treatment. But you can also get into trouble at the wrist, classically with the bike riders or with somebody using a cane or a walker just banging away at their, their wrist. Moving on to the median nerve. Again, three nerves in the upper extremity, very clean, very simple. Um, I'd recently had a patient who had just involvement in the palm, loss of feeling just in the palm, had pain, all these other things that you're thinking about. But the other part of the sensory portion here, which is interesting, is it flips over the top. Unlike the thumb, you can get problems on the dorsum of the hand. So this is one you're going to have to correct. Everybody, smart, you know, see what I did wrong here, okay? So we have the median nerve. We have these fingers that have gotten weak and that are flexed down. The, the old, unlike the ulnar nerve, where these two were locked down. This is the median nerve, and this is the papal position. This is the Benedictine position. This is the bishop, the pope giving you, so that's one way you can remember it. And so we want to test the median nerve for motor function. Um, and while this is sort of true, this is actually representative of a different part of the nerve being damaged, and it's actually somewhat a different part of the median nerve called the anterior interosseous nerve. We'll get to that. But you can see the distinction. On the left, very clean. On the right, there's a problem. The thumb and the index finger can't flex. They're just stuck like that. So they get a pinching position instead. So one of the common things that we deal with, everybody deals with day in and day out, is carpal tunnel. And so we look for the sensory involvement, like we've talked about, and then the motor involvement. And I'll tell you from my perspective, and Dr. Pogue, I'm very interested in what you have to say, but I love to look at the abductor pollicis brevis, which is this muscle right here in your palm. And if you can get the patient to cooperate and bring their thumb up in the air perpendicular to their palm, you're home free. I mean, it looks very nice. Or you can test that muscle. 
Instead, if they come in and this part of the muscle is just wasted, well, then there's a problem. And actually, it's a big problem in terms of determining how badly the median nerve is damaged because you don't want to get too far off. LOAF is the old lumbar call, opponens, abductor pollis brevis, and flexors. Um, again, having your patient do the opponens or do something like this and they don't do that, that's very helpful. Now, you're all familiar with the Tunnels and Phelan sign, just whacking the nerve or having the nerve uh, stretched and uh, one way or another can help. The patient will tell you, man, every time I hold the steering wheel, it drives me nuts. Every time I sleep at night, I have to hang my heart, arm off the bed and shake it out because it's miserable. It hurts. Um, and so, again, a representative picture. The enlargement of the tendons is one of the reasons that that nerve gets compressed. Phelan's maneuver is documented here. Okay. So this is the mistake I made in the previous one. And the anterior interosseous nerve problem is distinct. Um, and it's a problem up here more proximally in the elbow um, <clears throat> where a fragment of the nerve goes off and for whatever reason goes down and controls the flexor components of the hand. Um, there are concerns about compression in this area. Um, the most recent information I've seen is that they talk about this as being more idiosyncratic. And so chasing surgical interventions sometimes may not be there in your best interest. Um, but that's why you got a lot of people around here you can ask questions about and see what you, you think is best for your patient. Um, this is a classical lover nerve problem. Whether you love alcohol or your girlfriend or whatever, you got pressure on your upper arm here and you spent the whole night that way. And uh, the uh, radial nerve is very vulnerable as it wraps around the humerus and it's very easy to pick up. You got a wrist drop. You can't bring that hand up. What's happened, doc? I can't bring my hand up. Um, it's easy from a motor perspective. The sensory perspective is a little bit peculiar. Um, as you can see, it's the web here. And it's very interesting. There's some interesting historical features to that. But um, I kind of like to see if they can bring their extensor out like this. And you can feel the radial twig right here. And it can uh, involve the dorsum of your hand right there. Um, so you can check out and remind yourself of the sensory distribution of the, of the nerve. Um, so classically, this is a wrist drop. Um, I always like to use the word snuff box because um, in uh, Elizabethan, or not Elizabethan, I guess uh, in England, they used to use that as the put place to put their snuff and sniff away at it. So if they have weakness in that area or sensory problems in that area, that's helpful. And then a very easy one, although again, this is a little bit um, um, iffy, is uh, just have them hold their arm out. Say they don't have a wrist drop. Just have them hold their arm out and then press on it. Come here, John. So just stick your arm out straight somewhere. And um, we're going to come to this in a minute. This is not for radial nerve injury up here, but more out here. You press down on it, and yow, they'll jump off the, the roof because the, the nerve really hurts. Thanks a lot. So um, you have a problem sorting out radial nerve problems from brachial plexus problems, and I'll get to that eventually. So here's your quiz. Totally useless. There's no clicker here. There's no question. But I just wanted to read these names because in an era where we're losing all the ep eponymous naming of uh, organs and things like that. So what structure can injure the radial nerve? Is it the organ of Zuckercandel, the ligament of Struthers, the torcular of Herophili, the arcade of Froge, the zonule of Zen, and the ligament of Trites? Anybody want to make a fool out of themselves and throw their... No, there's two. Now, you know, you take tests. There's two ligaments. It's got to be a ligament, right? No, not. Um, it's the arcade of Froge, which is this uh, peculiar extensor part out here, which is entrapping the nerve. And we'll show you a picture of that. I just wanted to say the torcular of Herophily has... The nice thing is this guy's name was before Christ, and so is an Egyptian before Christ that documented where the superior sagittal fits into the lateral sinuses. 
and we still use that term, the torcula. And uh, the organ of Zucker candle is ectopic adrenal tissue around the spinal cord that um, somebody found. Okay, so anyway, radial nerve, here we got a spiral groove, and that's where you, most of the compression is going to happen. But then you can get into this other problem with this arcade of Froge compressing the posterior interosseous nerve. Okay, so treatment is dictated as a general rule by how badly the nerve is damaged. Uh, if function is preserved and symptoms are intermittent, then just try to stretch the area, keep the area of compression stable, and refer to the therapist. They do magic. They can do things. For me, and it's very practical as far as carpal tunnel, uh, if it's not too bad, you know, the concept is this is a very congested area. What can you do to stretch that out? 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, 5, right? Do things like that and uh, let the therapist guide uh, their care. Um, however, if you see a patient, and this is where the nerve conductions will come in, if you're really not getting much response out of the nerve, if you're seeing atrophy of the muscle, it's too late. You gotta get moving on this. You gotta do something to salvage the nerve, okay? So, brachial plexus. Um, Again, we talked already about this uh, confusion. I'm not sure why I had this slide here. I think I'll move ahead. But, uh, you know, in medical school, you had to learn that Robert Taylor drinks cold beer. And totally useless information. In practical matters, we never really kind of put that to any use. But uh, there are some peculiarities up here that are useful to perhaps know. Um, you have the long thoracic nerve uh, coming off very early. And that's a classic one for the wing scapula. You all have heard the wing scapula. And you can see that in your patients in their back. Um, there are some very important nerves up here as far as the shoulder um, that I get all, I have to kind of struggle to clarify as I go along. But it's very important to have a basic shoulder exam, and maybe, you know, m many of you do. But John, why don't you come here? What I kind of like to have as far as nerves are concerned, um, let's have your arms just like this. So I want you to keep that arm just like that. And don't let me push it to the middle here, okay? That's good. Now, let, let's go the other way. Don't let me push it out. So that's getting at more of the infraspinatus here. And then we're going to push your elbow away from your body. Go out like that. And that's getting at the supraspinatus, okay? So if I can just get that little bit done, I'm feeling pretty happy. That's before getting into deltoids and other things of that sort. Um, hopefully, that's not going to help you a whole lot with brachial plexus. And truthfully, I'm sorry, the thing that will help you the most with brachial plexus, particularly if it's a nerve-based problem, is just sticking your arm in the armpit, just getting up there and pressing in there and pushing around. If that makes them jump through the roof, that, then you're probably pretty close to home. But you also don't be shy about pressing around the collarbone and seeing if you can stir anything up there, okay? All right, oops, all right. So now this is a very controversial subject and one of my partners already is unhappy with this slide, but uh, <coughs> thoracic outlet is a real problem and it does show up. Um, the concept is very straightforward. Oh, I know why I had that previous slide. The nerves are going to exit under the uh, clavicle and above the ribs, and that's where they feel a lot of the problem exists. So you have this costroclavicular space, you have problems in the pectoralis muscle, and problems in the scalene muscle. For our perspectives as neurologists is to try and find neurogenic thoracic outlet. We're not going to worry about venous problems, we're not going to worry about arterial problems, um, although they do gamish, and I do like this Google picture showing how all, they're all getting squished up there by the muscles and the bones. But um, the reason that we had some unhappiness in reviewing this is because this is looking more like a C6 distribution, and if you think about it, the nerves that are going to get compressed are the ones at the bottom. It's going to be more C8. So classically, the true neurogenic thoracic outlet is going to be down here. Um, you know, going out to C8 distribution. Now, John, this is 
the moment of truth. You stand here, and I want to show you what I like to do. And this is, can be very helpful <clears throat> when you're seeing the patient. You say, okay, now you just let your arms hang down there, lice and loose. Okay, now, is it hurting right now? No. Now let me pull down on it. And if you start pulling down on it and they start going real unhappy, then that's helpful. But now the acid test is, now bring your shoulders to your ears, keep them up there. Now you try to pull down on it and it gets rid of the problem. That's very helpful. All of a sudden you can say that it's probably up here somewhere. Sorry, thank you. Um, all right, so now the bottom line on the thoracic outlet, okay, here is my take on thoracic outlet. You can traction and palpation. And it's very simple. You get the end of the exam, you say, well, madame, my dear, you got to become a Marine. And that's it. You want your shoulders up and back. You want to walk around like that. Because that's the only way you got to relieve the stretch in through here and get those shoulders back. And there, the therapist will help you a great deal in trying to get there. Surgery is a problem. And uh, I'd be interested in anyone's comments about surgery. I, I've yet to see a I've always seen success by surgery, but the problem just reoccurs. So, And the only vi virtue of nerve conductions is that we can rule out other nerve problems, sort of sorting that out. Okay, as far as cervical roots, did I jump too fast? I think I did. No, I didn't. Okay, good. So again, we've talked about motor and sensory patterns, triceps, biceps, wrist extensor strength. Pain, but you can provoke the pain with neck rotation and things like that. Reflex is extremely valuable for cervical root. So again, you can get this out of any book. You can go through the C5, C6, C7, C8 distribution. You can have the patient traction. And here's where you're going to see the mistake on Google, which is, wait a second, C8 doesn't split the fourth digit. So not everything you see on the Internet is true, right? C8 should involve both the fourth and the fifth digit. Now, now the fun begins when we talk about the lower extremity. And I mean that facetiously because it's really uh, not as clean cut as the upper extremity. Basically, from my perspective, the big three are the sciatic nerve and then how that breaks into the tibial and the perineal nerve. The sensory exam, as you can see, is just kind of a mess. And I will highlight what I think is very valuable, which is the deep perineal nerve, that web right in there. If you get something off that web in your patient exam, uh, they won't tell you that. But if you go there and stick it with a pen and it's numb, man, you're home free as a perineal nerve problem, not a sciatic nerve problem or whatever. Motor testing, I just put this in, it's way too busy. But it does emphasize, to my mind, that the sole of the foot is where the tibial nerve is going to be focused, and that's where you're going to pay your attention on that. Okay? So the big three made simple. Sciatic nerve is their pain to palpation and the posterior thigh. I mean, let's stop faking. You know, let's just go to the nerve, press on the nerve, see if that stirs it up. Is there numbness posteriorly in the heel? That sometimes can be very helpful. Tibial is very simple. They can't get up. They can't rise up on their toe. Um, perineal is just the opposite. They're, they can't get their toe up and they're scuffing and they're, they're walking along. So much like in the arm, I think there's no harm in going immediately to the popliteal fossa and feeling around posteriorly for a big cyst or going out to the fibular head and feeling around the perineal nerve and seeing if you can figure anything out with that. And I think the sensory and motor, unlike the upper extremity, I just don't see the lower extremity, the perineal and the uh, tibial nerve particularly giving me much help uh, in terms of those two complementing each other. So again, a very nice, beautiful picture of sensory dermatomes in the legs and then peripheral nerve distribution in the legs. One thing I'm going to show you in a minute with the plexus is uh, this posterior cutaneous nerve, which should be obedient to the sciatic nerve, really is separate from the sciatic nerve. So you can, you can go back here and test for sensation, but that may not be uh, lost in a sciatic nerve type problem. Um, so again, 
as far as I'm concerned, you can get some value looking at the lateral aspect of the leg and the deep perineal nerve in the web and then paying attention to the heel and the sole of the foot. I like these pictures because this is trying to sort out the lumbar root versus perineal, and again, perineal is mainly lateral, but apart from this little web here, the only other thing that I really find extremely useful in the foot is the big toe. Man, if the big toe is out, I'm home free. That's going to be L5, something of that sort, and particularly if it's hurting, it's a more likely to be a root type of problem. Um, there is a problem with the tibial nerve around the ankle. I would love to see this be the analog of the carpal tunnel. Um, the peculiarity here, uh, and I should have said early on, you know, so often you have orthopedic problems in the joint, you have musculoskeletal issues uh, beyond the nerve problem that make life difficult. But I recently had a patient came in with foot pain you squished the nerve, everything was exacerbated. So that was very helpful. Um, and she even had, which I didn't show very well on here, a lot of sensory disturbance on the sole of her foot, but on, similar to the hand, you do get a flip up onto the top of your toes with the tibial nerve. So that's kind of unique. All right, so tibial motor. It's all about plantar flexion. I have no idea why um, God gave us both the soleus and gastrocnemius, but we have two muscles there, and they do help us push off. And going after the pop popliteal fossa can be very helpful. As far as perineal, it's basically foot drop and eversion. And um, no, not ever far. Okay, one last, just before we get to some of the more proximal nerves, the compartment syndrome, it's always worth just palpating the tibia of the patient and the imme immediately adjacent uh, compartment. You can get um, sensory impairments uh, just from problems with that anterior tibialis muscle. And I thought this also caused some grief. A lot of the British refer to the perineal nerve as a fibular nerve, but I think you can see beyond that. So this is the sensory innervation of the sciatic nerve, which again, points to all these colored areas, but not so much to the gray. So sciatic nerve, what are we going to do? Okay, John, let's get to work here. Let's have you stand out there, and I'm going to get behind you. There's a couple things that I, and this pertains to the back as well. Um, so the um, sciatic nerve, we're basically going to come up back here and press into the uh, nerve area. But if you want to find the most common places for the sciatic nerve, it's going to be the cheek, butt cheek in there, and trying to get into the sciatic notch. And then, then I'll have John, I'm going to have you do this. I want you to uh, walk one foot in, the other foot straight. OK? That's it. All right, then come back with that right foot turned out. Yep. OK, good. So much like anything else, sometimes that can provoke damage or injury to the sciatic nerve. And uh, that's one where Dr. Wargo and Dr. Prento uh, do a great deal of service in terms of trying to help us with this uh, piriformis muscle. And that's how you elicit the piriformis muscle. Um, so, and while you're at it, and I didn't do it to John, you ought to feel the sacroiliac joint. So sciatic nerve, in my view, is usually more tibial involvement. You can test the hamstrings with your strength to see if you can pick up and, as I mentioned, internally rotate. As far as the lumbar plexus, this is true both for the brachial and the lumbar plexus. One of the things you really hate are these really sudden inflammatory injuries, uh, so-called Parsonage-Turner syndrome, where all of a sudden the brachial nerves are not working and they can be very heterogeneous, and not very specific, but it's an inflammatory condition. I mean, we're not unfamiliar with herpes zoster. We're not unfamiliar with other things where isolated nerves are damaged. Um, and so when we look at the lumbar plexus, we then have to do a do nod to the femoral nerves and the obturator nerve. Um, the main thing here is this is stabilizing your knee. 
very straightforward. Can you straighten your knee? Can you straighten it all the way out? And you can test this. Uh, where you see this most commonly is in um, isolated mononeuropathies, isolated uh, ischemic phenomenon. Now we're going to spend a moment talking about the lateral fem fem femoral cutaneous nerve, which comes off the um, brachial plex um, lumbar plexus, isolated, and uh, here's your little factoid for the day. What famous person had lateral femoral cutaneous syndrome or myalgia parasitica? Sigmund Freud, and he thought it was in his head, and he was wrong. <laughs> so uh, there you go. Um, made the trip worthwhile, right? No. Um, so it's very simple to get at this, just grasping around the anterior iliac spine and pressing in on that area uh, as up in here can isolate at that nerve and really send them through the roof. And myalgia parasitica refers to paralysis of the lateral aspect of the thigh. That's all there is to it. Um, the problem is, what do, you, what do you do with it? Now, if you're pregnant and the pregnancy goes away, then maybe the nerve compression goes away and you're happy. Maybe if you get rid of tight belts around your waist, it gets better. Uh, but, Truthfully, this again is an area where sometimes surgical intervention is uh, pursued, sometimes with benefits, sometimes not. And then as far as lumbar radiculopathy, just the anatomy, I just wanted to mention you have multiple issues, osteophytes, ligaments, disc, all of which, and facet joint, which can get enormously big to compromise the nerve root. So I'm not going to do this with... Yeah, I am. Okay. John, come over here. Let's do this uh, last little bit here. Stand there and appreciate it. You're going to get a standing O after this. You know that, right? All right. Turn around. So from my perspective in testing the back, I've already kind of gone through the sciatic nerve. And then I'm going to come up here and they're just going to grab the sacroiliac joint and press around in there. If that's the problem, they'll tell you, right? But I think it's very simple from this position. Just go ahead and bend at your waist. Lean forward, keep going, keep going, keep going. And see how the spine behaves. Come back up and extend. And what's the useful part of the extending the back is seeing what happens with the facet joints, right? You're putting all the pressure on the facet joints. And then likewise, rotating then starts to just rotate at the waist. Starts to bring out what happens to the uh, foramina, foramina as much as I can tell. Okay, and then lateral tilt and all that is probably pretty good. But I think st examining your patient standing up is sometimes very useful. Go ahead and have a seat. Um, no, I think we're done. Um, okay, so now a few words about nerve conductions. And I, you can get lost in this kind of conversation, but the, the, keep it real simple, all right? You stimulate the nerve and the muscle reacts, right? And the speed with which that happens depends on how far you're away from the muscle. This is a perfectly normal exam where you have stimulation at the wrist uh, of the ulnar nerve, uh, below and above the elbow, and two things we're measuring. The only two things that really matter are the speed and the amplitude. Speed and amplitude. So we can figure out how fast it went and how big it is. This is a picture of an EMG, and EMG is also used to try and tease out what nerve is involved, but that's a very, I'm not going to spend a lot of time about that, and it's not as simple as it looks. You need a good person that's good at EMGs to do that. And then my interest is, is the nerve slow or is low? That tells you what part of the nerve is damaged. If the nerve is slow, here's a nerve that's fine here. This is not good, right? Amplitude is very low. Speed is slow. And amplitude speaks to the myelin. And the axon speaks to, I'm sorry, got it just backwards. I'm sorry, the amplitude is due to the axon. And the speed is due to the myelin. So that's all you're trying to get out of it. And that's very valuable. Because if the nerve damage is to myelin, that's quite a different, different uh, set of pathology than um, if it's due to axon injury. Axon injury is usually ischemic. Myelin is usually inflammatory. Okay? 
So as far as polyneuropathies, the first thing is not mono, right? You got multiple nerve. And all these three issues are very important. Probably the simplest thing for all of us here is how fast is this happening, all right? If it's taking months, that's not a big deal. If it's taking days, that's a big deal. Uh, and that represents a whole different concern. And then you sort out whether it's symmetrical, whether it's distal, sensory motor. The classic term you're going to get from our lab, right, is link-dependent motor sensory axonal polyneuropathy. And um, what that unpacking that means is it's worse the further you're out on the nerve you are, and it seems to be the axon, which is we can't get much of a nerve response as we go further down the nerve. So. Again, graphically showing multiple mononeuropathies, which can occur, versus a polyneuropathy. And acute polyneuropathy, the buzzword, of course, is Guillain-Barre, right? We worry about that as representing here, usually as a motor phenomenon, but you should appreciate that there's sensory presentations quite often for Guillain-Barre, and it doesn't always have to be symmetrical. Uh, this is an impossible slide, and it's in your handout, but the, the point is acute you're going to worry about Guillain-Barre, and it's demyelinating, and you're going to appreciate that. And there are plenty of mimics. Subacute, long-lasting, are going to be, are they symmetrical? Are they asymmetrical? And now I'm going to get you to the last slide of the talk, which is a very simplified, this is how I approach it. Oh, no, it isn't. Sorry. This is a diabetic. <laughs> See? That was a teaser, wasn't it? I'm sorry. Um, this is actually, you know, what diabetes can do to the nerves. I mean, you can have proximal motor neuropathies, you can have small fiber neuropathies, large fiber neuropathies, um, on and on and all, pressure palsy. But now, here's the last slide. Focal neuropathy, think of compression. Symmetrical, think of diabetes, genetics, and toxins. What do you look at in their foot for genetic disorders? You look at the cock up toes, the high arch then it's the most likely the nerve is a genetic problem. I, I have been very impressed for the years I've been here. Primary care, everybody does their B12s, do their diabetes and everything like that, so I never have to think about that. But if the nerve is slowed then, and demyelinated, then you've got to worry about myeloma or immune processes. And fatigability, think myasthenia and atrophy with hyperflexia, think ALS. So, I'm sorry, but I think that's more than you wanted for the day, but I'm done. So uh, are there any particularly burning issues that you have about peripheral nerve things or any insights or observations you all have? Hearing none, going once, going twice. Thank you. I hope it was helpful.